Well, you ready for God's Word this morning? Uh, Pastor Daniel uh, gave me a very specific topic and, uh, about the church in Antioch. I, I think it's something that is in line with the series that you are doing. And it's about the church in Antioch. So I want to turn to you in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 11. If I could invite you to go there with me. And I thought it would be, it's meaningful because uh, this is the, uh, 40 years ago, Billy Graham came and declared Singapore as the Antioch of Asia. So it's important for us to find out what does it mean to be an Antioch church. So if you have your Bibles, you go with me now. Acts chapter 11, I'm going to read for you from verse 19. Uh, onwards. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen's travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. And some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Antioch, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You notice that beautiful line, huh? The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. And this happened during the reign of Claudius. And the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Lord, I pray this morning that you will open up our eyes to behold wonderful truths from your scripture. Thank you, God, that your, your, what you promise us is true, that the flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit that gives life. And the words that you have spoken to us, they will be spirit and there will be life. So I pray that the, the word of God this morning will become life to all of us. And as your servant share, may you hide your servant behind the cross so that Jesus alone shall be exalted. So come, Lord, and take preeminence in this place and let your word minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, one of the most uh, amazing things in this century is the advent of a soft drink called Coca-Cola. Uh, it is so amazing because from the city of Albania all the way to the highest mountain in Thailand, you can find a bottle of Coke. Is that true? Uh, and this is actually in fulfillment of the vision that was put forward by the founder of the Coca-Cola empire, Robert Woodruff, in 1923. He actually cast it as a vision in 1923. And his vision was this, that everyone in the world, regardless of country, regardless of colour, regardless of culture, will be able to have a taste of Coca-Cola, or what they call the real thing. You know? And that was his vision. That every colour, every tribe, every, every culture will have a taste of Coca-Cola. Now, and it expanded everywhere. Now, in the book of Acts, we also see the rapid expansion of the gospel all over the then known world. Now, the only difference between the spread of the gospel and the spread of the Coca-Cola empire is this. That the spread of Coca-Cola was, was the result of a systematic strategy that was put out by the founder and all that. But the spread of the kingdom of God is sudden. The spread of the kingdom of God was spontaneous. In fact, the only blueprint you really get from our founder, our Lord Jesus Christ, was simply this. You stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you shall be my witnesses from Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That was all. Is that true? That was the only blueprint they got from the founder. And yet, it happened. But what happened also was this, when you study the spread of the church, you discover this, that the disciples were actually so comfortable in Jerusalem that God had to literally kick them out of Jerusalem by sending them a persecution. 
Remember how when they received that wonderful gospel, what the Jewish believers did was they took the gospel, wrapped it up with a Jewish flag, and basically kept it to their own people. They kept it to themselves, you see, until God had to literally come down and scatter them. How did He do that? It was through, the pers through persecution, through one little man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And when Saul started persecuting the church and scattering the church, what he did not realize was that right from the beginning, God was using him for world evangelism. And because of the persecution that Saul did to the church, the church began to spread, the Bible tells us in Acts 11. The church began to spread to Phoenicia, it spread to Cyprus, which is actually two of the main shipping ports of the ancient world gospel begin to go there but most importantly the gospel came to a city called Antioch Antioch at that time was the third largest city uh, in, in, in the ancient world but it was a very immoral city it was a city filled with gambling dens pubs and prostitution it was like the Las Vegas of the ancient world the chief goddess in the city of Antioch was a goddess called Diana her temple was actually used not just for practicing idolatry, but also for temple prostitution. Uh, it was the deep place for people to actually express all of their lusts. It was actually a very, very tough city. And Antioch would have been a tough place to actually plant a church. But yet, listen to me, brothers and sisters, it was right here in the city of Antioch that the first Gentile church was born. Has it not been for the church in Antioch, you and I won't be here. This was the place where the first Gentile church was born. And it was in Antioch that all of us got our nickname as Christians. We were first called Christians in Antioch. So what I'd like to do this morning is this. I'd like to trace for you the evolution of this church and, 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 and then... To, to see what are the, the characteristics that are found in a church like this. Now, if we are meant to be the Antioch of Asia, then I'm sure our city will be filled with Antioch churches. See? And then we need to find out what is it that makes the Antioch church tick? What are, the, what are the factors that are in the Antioch church? And then after that, at the end, I'd like you to put BBTC side by side with the Antioch church. And you see for yourself if you are... Do you have the Antioch factor? Are you an Antioch church? Would that be okay? Alright, so follow along with me as I take you through this journey. Now, the early church, as I said earlier, was getting comfortable in Jerusalem. But our God is a God of expansion. God's intent is never for us just to get saved and then sit in the pews. God's intent was to get us saved so that we can serve in the few. Is that right? We were not meant to just get saved and sit on pews. We were meant to serve in the field. So what did God do? God then allowed persecution to come. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, is where it all began. When Stephen was stoned to death, the next thing that happened was this. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So when the persecution came, the early church was forcefully kicked out of Jerusalem. And of course, the gospel went along with them as they were being scattered. But the interesting thing to note was this. Unfortunately, even though the Jewish believers were scattered, but yet they were still, they were still stubbornly agnocentric. And, and what did they end up doing? If you look at Acts 11 verse 19, it tells us this. Those who are scattered told the message only to Jews. So even though they were scattered out of Jerusalem, they still only told the message to their own people. And it was only in Antioch, brothers and sisters, when the breakthrough came. The breakthrough came in Acts chapter 11, verse 20. When they arrived in Antioch, that's when they begin to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So here in Acts eleven twenty, we see the believers from Cyprus and Cyrene broke the tradition. And then they started sharing the, the gospel with the Greeks as well. So for the first time, the gospel actually jumped the fence from the Jewish world into the Gentile world. And then the next thing that happened was recorded in verse 23 and 24. Listen to what happened. 
when the, the gospel started to go to the Greeks, unexpectedly, revival started to break out among the Gentile people. And I think they were so shocked that the next thing recorded was this. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem and then they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. You know, I am so glad, brothers and sisters, that when news of a Gentile revival went to Jerusalem and reached the ears of the, the apostles, they sent the right man to go and check it out. I'm so glad they sent Barnabas. I'm so glad they didn't send Peter. If they sent Peter, he would have crushed the whole, he would have killed the whole revival. But they sent a guy called Barnabas. The word Barnabas actually means son of encouragement. He was obviously a very encouraging person, a very affirming person. And true to his nature, Barnabas actually went and instead of upholding tradition, he, up, he affirmed the gracious work of the Holy Spirit amongst them. And then he encouraged them, press on. This is of God. Keep doing. So, and and that's, it takes a man like Barnabas to do it. And as a result, the revival was not squashed, but the revival actually was fewered. See, and it, it continued to spread. And I tell you this, Barnabas didn't just go to Antioch, saw all the good work and say, well done, well done, you know, good job. No, he actually stayed back and he provided leadership to this thriving move of God in Antioch. And I have no doubt that the church in Antioch will be one of the fastest growing churches of that time. But listen to me, this is the very important part. Barnabas being the man that he was, he did not make use of the revival in, in, in Antioch as a stepping stone to build his own influence, to build his own uh, prominence. He didn't do that. Do you know that I, I was thinking, if I put myself in the shoes of Barnabas, I could easily ride the wave you know, that the Antioch revival is creating and make a name for myself. He could have done that. He could have just you know, read, write a book on it and then come up with a church growth seminar and take it around the world. He could have made a video we would have done that, put it on social media. He would have become a church consultant overnight. Pastors, conference speaker everywhere in the world. But instead of focusing on his own development, you notice that Barnabas did something radical. He did something so unexpected. You know what he did? You look at verse 25 and 26 of Acts 11 now. This is what he did. Listen carefully. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Now, you ask, let me ask you, why do you think Barnabas go all the way to Tarsus to go and look for Saul? Now, you've got to bear in mind eh, that Barnabas at that time is a big gun you know, in the early church. It's like a bishop status. And yet, this big gun would actually go all the way to Tarsus in the midst of a thriving revival. He dropped everything, went all the way to Tarsus to look for this little unknown preacher called, called Saul. Why would he do that? Hello? You thinking with me? Why would Barnabas do that? You see, and, and I think, and, and bear in mind, during those days, when when you, when you want to go and look for someone in another city, it's, it's not like today, you know, you just drop them an email and then you hop on an A380 and you fly there. It doesn't work that way. During those days, they literally have to hike for miles. They walk for miles to actually go and find, find Saul. But Barnabas did that. He went all the way to look for Saul. Why did he do that? I think it's because being the mentor that he was, he recalled, you know, that this was Saul's moment. Because if you remember, when Saul got converted after the road to Damascus, he went to Jerusalem to try and connect with the apostles. But none of them was willing to meet him because they were so afraid that he's going to come and then he's going to persecute them. So there was only one person who actually went to meet Barnabas, uh, and went to meet Saul. Who was that? It was Barnabas. Barnabas was the only guy who actually met up with Saul, verified his story, and then sponsored him into the, into the church in Jerusalem. And being the mentor that he was, he would have remembered that Saul told him that when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, God called Saul to be an apostle. 
right? Apostle to who? Apostle to who? To the Gentiles, right? And now when the Gentile revival started to break out, the first person that came to Barnabas' mind was who? Was Saul. And he realized this was Saul's moment. This was his moment of destiny. And he knew that he had to get Saul to enter into his destiny. So he went all the way to Tarsus to bring his mentor into his fullest potential. Are you with me here? What a heart. And not only did Barnabas bring Paul to Antioch, but he actually stayed on with him for one whole year. See, and I don't think it's so much because Barnabas needed Paul to help him. But it's more be, he stayed because he knew that Paul needed him. Because remember, Paul came from the background of the Jewish sect, Pharisee of Pharisees and all that. And now he has to minister amongst the Gentiles. And Barnabas stayed back to mentor Paul into his destiny. And at the end of that one whole year of teaching and, and discipleship, what happened was the believers in Antioch became so like Christ the Antiochians nicknamed them Christians. And the interesting thing I found out in history is this, you know, the Antiochians are famous for doing one thing. They are famous for being able to give appropriate nicknames to people. They are very good at that. You know, so if they look at someone like uh, a Brother Jeffrey, he uh, say, oh, Elder Jeffrey, uh, oh, funny man. And, uh, <laughs> he really can make me laugh. You know? That's an appropriate nickname. Look at someone like me and say, Handsome. And, uh, no, 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 joking, joking. <laughs> Skinny or something like that. Huh? that because they are very good at appropriate nicknames. But when they observe the, 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 the disciples, look at their conduct, look at their lifestyle, look at the way they, look at their character, they can't help but to conclude uh, the only appropriate nickname they can think of. They are so like their master, they decided to nickname them Christians. How many of you know it's a wonderful testimony? If someone were to look at us, imagine if someone look at you, you're all from BBTC, someone look at you and they say, wow, you are so like your pastor, they decide to call you Daniel. You know, that would be amazing, right? Because you're so like, the, you're so like your master, you're so like your pastor. It's the same thing here. They were so like Christ, they call them Christians. See, and I tell you this, the beautiful thing about all this is that no one really know who started the church in Antioch. There was no mention of any individual or group that started the church. It was birthed simply through ordinary believers who shared this inherently powerful gospel and the powerful church was birthed. See, and historians actually estimated that the church in Antioch actually grew by, uh, to about 25,000 people. It was a huge, powerful, influential, cutting-edge church of that time. And my question really for all of us today is, what kind of a church is the church in Antioch like? 40 years ago, Billy Graham came to Singapore. And it was the first time he publicly declared that Singapore is the Antioch of Asia. The Antioch of Asia. And if that is the case, then the question to ask ourselves is, what is the Antioch church like? And then we ask ourselves, is BBTC like the church in Antioch? That would be a good way of finding out if we are really fulfilling our destiny as the, as the church, uh, the Antioch of Asia. So as, as I look through this passage, I want to outline for you this morning four marks of an Antioch church. Or if I can say, these are the Antioch factors. And, uh, there are four of them I want to outline for you. The first is this. The Antioch church is a church that is growing through evangelism. It's a church that is growing through evangelism. The church in Antioch was the first to share their faith with others, whether Jews or Gentile. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 20, it says, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling the good news about Jesus Christ. I tell you, how did the church in Antioch grow to 25,000? Very simple. They were actually sharing the gospel with those that are far away from Christ. That was how the church grew. You know, Singapore is a church full of mega churches. It's, this is an amazing city 
Now, I come from Perth now, so I can say, from the outside, I'm looking in and say, Singapore is an amazing city. There are, there are awesome things happening in this city. Now, just look about, think about this. To be able to gather 30,000 Christians together to pray for a few hours, just to come and pray, 30,000 people. That, to me, is an amazing fit. You could well be a city in revival and don't realize it. You know, God is doing some amazing things in this place. But one of the things that I, every, on the heart of every pastor I know and I speak to, they all pray and they all hope that our churches are growing through evangelism and not transfer growth. You, you're with me? You know, I know there are so many big churches. You know, somebody say you throw any stone and you might hit a mega church you know, in Singapore. It's just so many. But the question is this, where, how do we grow the church? Are we growing it through transfer? You know, because the church down the road come and join us? Or is it because we're growing through evangelism? On the heart of every pastor I know, it's a dream that we will grow through evangelism. The church in Antioch is a church that grows through evangelism. A.T. Pearson, the great missiologist, once wrote this. He says, with none of our modern facilities, he's talking about the church in Antioch, he says, with none of our modern facilities, the gospel flew from lip to lip until it touched the bounds of the Roman Empire. And within one century, such one-on-one -on -one evangelism shook paganism to its core. In the paganistic world that they are in, through the gospel flying from lip to lip, literally people just telling each other about the gospel, it shook paganism to its core. I pray that this can happen in Singapore. I'm so glad that year 2019 is going to be a year of proclamation. It's a year where the gospel will fly from lip to lip. How many of you are looking forward to the great harvest next year? We're trusting God for a massive harvest of souls. Let there be evangelism that grows the church. In fact, I think next year, it's not just about celebration of hope. You know, uh, one of the initiatives that we are pushing, and Edric is part of it as well, we are pushing that before Celebration of Hope, we can have 500 groups running Alpha everywhere. And then after Celebration of Hope, another 500 groups running Alpha everywhere. Imagine you have 500 groups before, 500 groups after, 1,000 groups running Alpha everywhere, in offices, factories, everywhere. And then each group has two persons saved. How many souls will we get? 2,000 will be added to the kingdom of God. How many of you believe that can happen? Ah, this service, not bad. <laughs> all the other service I ask, silence. Well, all the faithful people are here. But I believe so. That God can actually make this come to pass. You know, and I, I, I like this poem that someone, someone uh, wrote. It goes like this. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care and few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today. Why not? Melt my heart, fill my life. Give me one soul today. And Acts 11 verse 21, tell us how that church grows through evangelism. It, it goes like this. The Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believe and turn to the Lord. The secret to their growth is not just the methods or the strategies as Pastor Singh Lee has said. It is simply this. The Lord's hand was with them. The Lord's hand was with them. And the only way I know that we move the hands of God is through prayer. That's the only way we move the hands of God, through prayer. You know, that's an old song we used to sing. We don't sing it as much now. The song goes like this. And every time I pray, I move the hands of God. My prayer does the things my hands cannot do. And every time I pray, the mountains are removed and paths are made straight and nations turn to you. Every time I pray, I move the hands of God. My prayer does the things my hands cannot do. We learn, we learn to talk to God about the loss before we talk to the loss about God. We get on our knees before we can advance on our feet. And that's evangelism undergirded by prayer. And I think that is an Antioch factor. We grow through evangelism. Growing through evangelism. Here's number two, very important one. 
grounded through discipleship. The Antioch Church is not just sharing the gospel, getting numbers saved and, re- and, and all that, but they are also a church that is grounded with evangelism, uh, grounded with discipleship. Now, you all know how when the news of what's happening in Antioch came to the ears of the apostles in Jerusalem, they will be wondering, what? The Greeks coming to, 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 to the Lord cannot be. They became very worried. They wonder what that is. So they sent Barnabas there to check it out. He was encouraged by what he saw. But Barnabas knew this, that the key is not just to reap a harvest. We also need to preserve the harvest. And Barnabas understood that the only way to do responsible evangelism is when not only do we get people saved, but we actually disciple them in the ways of God. Dawson Trotman, the founder of Navigators, used to say, it only takes one day to make a convert, but it takes a year at least to make a disciple. It takes a short time to get someone to Christ, but it takes a long time to make someone into a disciple. So what did he do? Went all the way to Tarsus, brought Paul, and then they began to teach the church. They were grounding the church in the ways of God. And at the end of that whole process, what happened? We were told in Acts 11 verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You know what this narrative informs us? Listen carefully, huh? I think this narrative informs us of the important principle that we need Barnabas before we can raise the Pauls in our midst. We need more men and women of encouragement, men and women with a mentoring spirit, men and women who desire to disciple others, pour their lives into others, help other people to succeed. We need Barnabases before we can see the Pauls rise up from among us. The ministry of discipleship, mentoring, encouragement, I believe is what nurtures the next generation of disciple makers for the Church of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, it's not so much that Barnabas needed Paul, but I think it's because Paul needed Barnabas. Now, I'm so glad that year 2018 has been declared a year of prayer this year. But next year, it's going to be a year of proclamation. But year 2020 has been declared as a year of personal discipleship. And I have a feeling that Singapore is on the right track to becoming that Antioch church. What do you think? Yeah? From prayer to proclamation to personal discipleship. I think that we are on a right track. We are on to something as a nation. And we should look forward with great expectation to see what, how God is going to move in Singapore. Antioch factor number one, growing through evangelism. Antioch factor number two, they were grounded through discipleship. Here's the third one and a very important one. The Antioch church is one that is governed by the Holy Spirit. It's a church governed by the Holy Spirit. Not only was the church in Antioch evangelizing, making disciples, but they were also moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Antioch church was not driven by a committee. It was actually driven by the Spirit. You look at Acts 11 verse 27 now. Okay, take a look at this. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. And this happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. Now, you notice from this narrative that the Antioch church welcomed the prophetic. Is that right? A prophetic band came and they welcomed the prophetic and then they also responded readily to the moving of the Spirit. Once they sensed that that was the Holy Spirit speaking, they were quick to act on what the Spirit is saying. And this is true not just in Acts 11 when they just started, but that same openness to the Spirit continued all the way into Acts chapter 13, which is another very critical point in the life of the church in Antioch. So go with me now to Acts 13, where you see the same openness to the Spirit. Okay, Acts 13, I read for you from verse 1 to verse 3. Now, are you with me so far, everyone? All good? You following me? Okay, now you look at Acts 13, you look at verse 1 to 3. In the church at Antioch, now as we read this, I'd like you to pay attention to who are all the people that are listed inside. Okay, because everyone is meaningful. Listen to this. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Maniam, who, is, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, 
and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they fasted and they prayed, they placed their hands on them and then they sent them off. Now the first thing you notice is that there are prophets and teachers in the leadership team. So obviously the fivefold ministry was at work in the church in Antioch. Okay, then notice also the presence of prophets and teachers also tell us the beautiful balance. It speaks of that beautiful balance between the spirit and the word. Do you notice that? Prophets and teachers, the spirit and the word operating in this cutting edge church. And I say to you, BBTC, that to be an Antioch church, we must strongly embrace both the Word and the Spirit. We want to be Word-based, but at the same time, Spirit-empowered. And this is one thing I respect BBTC for so much. And I'll say to you, brothers and sisters, you are known in the city for, as a church that is marked by solid biblical teaching. You have a pastor at the pulpit that preached with more verses than I can remember. You know, and he can go at that for a whole hour. It's amazing. You literally have a church that is marked by solid biblical teaching. But beyond that, you actually gone past that to actually move into the things of the Spirit in signs, wonders, and miracles following. I don't know about you. If I were you, I'll be very proud to be in a church like this. Are you? I don't know about you, but I actually think that it's amazing. You have a church that is able to hold the tension between teachers and prophets. You know, just to be able to be that kind of a church. And I am so proud that, to be associated with a church like this. A church that is fiercely biblical, but yet so moving powerfully in the Spirit. But notice also, besides that, in the church in Antioch, you must notice there is unity in diversity. There is diversity, not just in terms of ministry, but also in terms of culture, in terms of ethnicity. Okay, notice the kind of people that are listed there, right? For example, you notice not only are there prophets and teachers, but there are also Jews like Barnabas and Paul. But there's also a guy called Simeon, who, and they call him Niger. Okay? And, and, and some Bible scholars actually believe that Niger comes from Africa. The reason is because they nicknamed him Niger. The word Niger actually means black. So obviously, it's a dark-skinned person. And then there was a guy called Lucius, which means white. So you have black and then you have white. And, and Lucius is from Cyrene. And then there's this guy called Manium, who, who's linked to the royal family of Herod. Now you put all that together, what do you see? What you see is this, unity in diversity. The prophets and the teachers, that's ministry diversity. And then you have Jews and Gentiles, that's ethnic diversity. And then you have black and white, there's racial diversity. And then you have rich and poor, there's social diversity. There's so much diversity just in the leadership team alone. But yet in all the diversity, there is unity. Why? Because they are all one in Christ. What a beautiful church, what do you think? I think that's a beautiful church. And I pray that BBTC will be a church like that, where any race can be happy here where anybody can be included, everyone can feel we are one because we are all rooted in Christ. Amen. And I think that's the kind of church we all look for. And, and it will be awesome. Awesome. And, while, and in unity, as they seek the Lord together, as they're waiting upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit begins to speak again prophetically. And this time He said, Set me apart Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. The power of the prophetic was at work in the church in Antioch. And I think that's another Antioch factor. Growing in evangelism, grounded with discipleship, governed by the Spirit. And I'll leave you one last one. It was a church that is geared towards missions. Geared towards missions. The church in Antioch not only listened to all these prophecies, but they actually responded to them. We look at their response, you know, they are very missional people. They are a church that is geared towards missions. For example, the moment they heard about the famine in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, what happened after that? The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help 
for the brothers living in Judea. So they were missioner. They begin to give. And in the same way, after the word was released in Acts 13 2, to set aside Barnabas and Paul, the leadership team fasted and prayed. And then they laid hands on them and sent them forth. This is apostolic authority at work. Look at verse, th- verse 3, right? So after they fasted and prayed, they lay hands, then they released them. That is apostolic authority at work. The church in Antioch was an apostolic church. They laid hands on both of them and sent them away. And that word send is uh, in the Greek, it's a Greek word apollo, from where we get the word apostle, which literally means send one. So listen to me, brothers and sisters. Unless and until you are sent, you are not an apostle. I don't care what your name card says. You can claim to be an apostle. You can call yourself whatever. But unless and until you are sent, you are not an apostle. Because the word apostle simply means a sent one. And the church in Antioch was an apostolic church. And they sent forth those whom God has called. Amen. So now, the leadership in Antioch you know, suddenly could see the bigger picture. See, I tell you all this to tell you one thing, that the, ch- the leadership in Antioch cannot see the bigger picture of what the Lord's agenda was behind the, the, the re- revival that they were experiencing. They know that the revival is not just so that everybody can have a good time, you know, hi, hi, cry, cry, lie down on the carpet for a while, then get up, and then all go downstairs and eat potluck dinners. You know? so that's not the purpose of the revival. They realized that they were blessed to be a blessing. They were blessed so that they could be sent forth. And that was what it's all about. And I know that they did this in willing obedience. They sent forth Barnabas and Saul in willing obedience to the voice of the Spirit. And because later on in Acts 14, verse 26 to 28, the church eagerly received back Barnabas and Paul to hear their good report. Can I read this one for you? Acts 14, 26 to 28. This is what happened. From, from Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they, have committed to the, where they have been committed to the grace of God for the work that they have now completed. That means what? They have finished their work and now they are coming back. And arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God has done through them and how He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the apostles. You know, I'm so glad, brothers and sisters, that the church in Antioch did not just stop in Acts 11 or Acts chapter 12 where they were blessed. Because in Acts 11 and 12, they were so blessed. But they went all the way to Acts 13 where they became a blessing to the nations. Hallelujah. They were blessed in order to be a blessing. Many of you here are so blessed, but you are blessed to be a blessing. And what is amazing to me is that it, between Acts 11 all the way to Acts 13, the church grew in influence and impact. Now I tell you, my friends, BBTC I have watched this church for many, many years. I have watched your church uh, from the time that it first started until now. And I can tell you in no uncertain terms that I think this church has literally grown over the years to where you are today. And when I take these four factors, okay, uh, growing through evangelism and grounded in discipleship, governed by the Spirit, geared for missions. And then I put BBTC side by side. Let me ask you today, huh? you tell me, honestly, are you a church growing through evangelism? Yes. Are you a church that is grounded with discipleship? Are you a church that is governed by the Spirit? Are you a church geared for missions? Then guess what? You are an Antioch church. It's as simple as that. You are an Antioch church. And you need to recognize that. And whether you realize it or not, whether you real, all through the years, I watched this church. And I actually believe that you are one of those Antioch churches that is in this city. And we are actually, without even realizing it, fulfilling our destiny to be the Antioch of Asia. This church, this, this city has to be full of churches that are like the Antioch church. 
growing in evangelism, grounded in discipleship, you know, governed by the Spirit and geared towards missions. And if we are doing that, we are literally fulfilling our destiny as the Antioch of Asia. And I believe I'm looking forward, you know, to us seeing this come to pass in an even greater measure over these next few years, all the way to 2020. But here's my burden for you as we bring this to a close. Throughout this whole journey, there is one principle that stood out. There's one thread, you know, that links all the chapter 11, 12, 13 all together. There's one undergirding principle in all this. And that principle is one word, obedience. Obedience. Now, I, I know this is not a very popular word, but obedience is the principle that runs throughout this whole narrative. And I'll tell you why. Everything started because of the obedience of one man. His name was Stephen. Remember Stephen? He preached the gospel. And as a result, he got stoned to death. And when the stones were falling upon him, Stephen looked up to heaven. And you read Acts chapter 7. Stephen looked up to heaven and he said this. He says, Lord, receive my spirit. And But before he breathed his last, he added one more phrase. He says, Lord, do not take this against them. He was actually echoing the words of his master on the cross. Lord, Forgive them for they know not what they do. And as the stones fall upon him, there was one man that was standing at the side watching this whole thing, giving approval to it. In fact, he was holding the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. You know what his name was? Saul. Saul was there. He watched this whole thing. And I don't think he just walked away like that. Something happened to him inside. He start, his conscience began to prick him. He saw a good man die. And he know that there's something about this. His conscience actually begin to prick him. How do I know this? It's because later on, when, when Saul met Christ on the road to Damascus, he got knocked off his horse, right? And then God spoke to him. And the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? But in his own testimony before King Agrippa, uh, in Acts 26, he actually added another line. He says, when I got struck down off the horse and the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he added another line. He says, the Lord asked me, why do you kick against the goat? Have you ever seen that phrase? Why do you kick against the goat? Actually, it's a metaphor that literally means, why do you kick against a thorn? Why do you kick against a prick, you know? In other words, you know that that thing is, uh, is, is, is uh, pricking you and yet you go and kick against it. What's he saying? He's actually saying, Saul, you know within your own conscience there is something there when Stephen died. But yet you went against it and you purposely kick against your own conscience. That was what he was doing until God had to confront him. And it was that moment Saul's life turned around. Are you with me? I started with one man's obedience and his name was Stephen. And then, through the obedience of the ordinary believers in Acts 11, the church, the Gentile church was born. Obedience was, was the key. And then came the obedience of Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, 25 that gave birth to the ministry of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, which gave birth to all of us today. Is that right? It's because Barnabas was willing and obedient went all the way to Tarsus, looked for Saul. And that started the missionary movement in the early church. And then finally, through the obedience of the church in Antioch, the first missionary movement of the world was born in Acts chapter 13. Again, it was obedience, obedience, obedience. That, to me, is the undergirding factor in all of this. It's the word obedience. And ever since then, there has been many more obedient men and women of God throughout the centuries that gave birth to the modern missionary movement as we know it today. Can I declare to you, brothers and sisters, the key to BBTC becoming the Antioch church that you are was the obedience of many, many people in this place. And the key to keep it going into the future is also the same word, obedience. Obedience obedience. And I challenge every one of you in BBTC today, would you stay obedient to the Lord? 
would you stay obedient to what God is saying to you this morning? There are some of us here this morning, God is challenging you to do things. There are ministries put on your heart, you know, things and plans and purposes that God has, and He's challenging you to actually obey Him. Do what you know God is saying to you. Then I think it's going to take BBTC to the next level. It's always obedience. Some individual somewhere obeyed God and everything turned. Tell you a couple of stories before we close. Is that okay? There's a guy called George Scott. He was a missionary. One of the first missionaries to China Inland Mission founded by Huxon Taylor. Later on became renamed as OMF. The interesting thing about George Scott was this. He only had one leg. He's a Scottish man. He only got, he's a one-legged fella. And he actually turned up as one of the first few to be interviewed, you know. He wanted to be interviewed to become a missionary to China. The interviewer take one look at him and then they ask him this, why do you want to go to China since you only got one leg? His answer was very simple. His reply was, I'm going to China with one leg because the two-legged ones won't go. <laughs> that was his answer. And it's true. He just wanted to obey God. And so they sent him. They just sent him with one leg. They sent him. And in 1868, he went to Wenzhou in China. Started a small school there. And after a few years, planted a little church there. He added to his team only one other person. And this guy was a Chinese boy who is partly paralyzed. Now, so can you imagine this great combination? We have a one-legged Scottish man with a half-paralyzed Chinese boy. Not, not exactly a great team. But God looked beyond their physique and actually saw their heart and used them. And the church in Wenzhou started to grow. From an atheistic city, when, when uh, George Scott went there in 1868, it had 6 million people there. But by the year 1979, there were 600,000 evangelical Christians in Wenzhou. It became known as the Jerusalem of China. Do you know today, you go to Wenzhou, they have one, more than 1,000 church buildings officially open for worship and another 1,100 meeting points in the villages all over, and countless number of underground fellowships that are going on in the city of Wenzhou. One historian actually wrote, wrote this, who could have imagined in their wildest dream that the seed that was originally sown by a one-legged Scotsman and a paralyzed Christian boy, could, a Chinese boy, could ever, um, could, could, would, would over a century later bear such fruit? You know, and it's because of one word, obedience. Because they were willing to obey, God was using them. I'll tell you one more before we close. One of my favorite missionaries, uh, missionary story is Dr. David Livingston. He was a doctor in England. When God called him, you know, through a magazine that he saw, and then the smoke from a thousand, thousand villages rising up, you know, in, in Africa. And he decided to drop his career. He went to Africa. When he first went there, he didn't come back for five full years. He didn't come back. He just stayed there and labored away. And by the time he came back, he already lost one eye and was crippled in one leg. The reason is because he was chased by a lion. And he was running and he hit his, hit his face on a hanging branch. And as a result, lost his eye. And then he was crippled in the leg. And, but he came back after five years to retire. But because of his love for Africa, he just could not sit still. He could not retire. And so for a second time, one more time, he took his wife, sold everything he had, went back to Africa. And within a short time in, in the second round, his wife died of a tropical disease. He had to bury his wife in Africa. And standing by the graveside of his wife, any lesser man would have given up and gone home at that point. But David Livingston, at the side of his of his wife's grave, rededicated his life once again to Africa and he stayed on. He stayed on for many years after that. Years later, by that time, he was physically very, very ill. But one day he said to his two disciples, you know, I'm going to go in my room and pray. Two hours later, I'll come and join you for lunch. So he went to his room as his practice was, knelt down and he prayed. First hour, didn't move. Second hour, he was still on his knees. Lunch was getting cold, so one of the disciples walked in to ask him to come for lunch. They shook him and called him, teacher, teacher. And David Livingston, at that point, fell over dead. And the, the biographer that wrote his story actually had this statement 
and it goes like this. Dr. David Livingston died exactly the same way that he lived in the presence of his God. And when he died, the British government wanted his body back because by that time he has became very well known as a missionary in Africa. They wanted to give him a great barrier. But the disciples in Africa know that his heart is in Africa. So before they sent the body back, two of the disciples actually took a knife, cut his heart out and kept the heart, sent the body back. And they bury his heart in Africa. You go to London today in Westminster Abbey, you can visit the tombstone of Dr. David Livingstone. But if you go to Tanzania today, there's a big tree. And on the bottom of the tree, there's this inscription no, that reads like this. Underneath this tree lies the heart of Dr. David Livingstone. And that's true. His heart was in Africa. Why? One word. Obedience. Because he was obedient to the Lord. The Lord used him. And today, Africa is one of those countries where we see great revival. Isn't it true? One man's obedience. Do you want to be an Antioch church, which I believe you are, and you want to continue in that journey, what it takes is individuals among us who will obey God. It's not just about a church obeying God. It's all of us as individuals obeying what God put on our hearts to do. And we can see Singapore transform because of obedience. That's the Antioch factor. Amen.